Welcome to Discover with Dr. Dan, the proactive health podcast. Epigenetics and how it can influence all aspects of our lives is a topic we will address today. With us is renowned epigeneticist, Professor Moja Schiff. From the TED stage to giving lectures all around the world, Moja is an expert on how the way our DNA is expressed can influence all aspects of human health. Moja, my friend, it's, great. it's a great pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to give our listeners a brief bio sketch of you and your accomplishments. Moshe is a professor of pharmacology and held a GlaxoSmithKline and James McGill chair in pharmacology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian, America, uh, Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Moja has pioneered research in DNA methylation for the last three decades and published more than 300 papers on the biological role of DNA methylation that span a broad spectrum from, uh, from basic mechanisms to cancer diagnostics and therapeutics, as well as behavior, chronic pain, and addiction. Schiff pioneered epigenetic pharmacology in cancer, as well as the field of behavioral epigenetics. Schiff's studies provide a molecular link between environment and genes, between nurture and nature, that had a wide impact on the social sciences and psychiatry. Schiff founded the first pharma company in the world dedicated to developing DNA methylation drugs, Methylgene Inc. Last year, Schiff founded HKG Epitherapeutics at the Hong Kong Science Park, which develops a novel class of epigenetic diagnostic markers for early detection of cancer and other diseases aimed for routine checkup in the general population to prevent disease and increase health and well-being. So amazing accomplishments. Moja, again, so grateful to have you on the show that you would take time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. So uh, Happy to be here. So grateful to have you. So Moja, how did you get into the field of epigenetics and DNA methylation specifically? Just by serendipity, um, as most things in science happen, uh, we don't wake up in the morning and decide to make a great discovery. Mm -hmm. It just happens. Uh, I was a student actually in dentistry at the time oh. when I needed to write a thesis. And uh, I was looking for a supervisor and the first supervisor I encountered in the corridor was a young uh, professor who just came back from a postdoc at Caltech. Mm. And he discovered the first methyl group in a bacteriophage that infects E. coli. Mm. It's not, it wasn't very important, but it introduced us to the field of epigenetics. Wow. How cool is that? Uh, like you said, it's amazing. When you do science, you start out on one path and it's amazing how it weaves exactly. and winds to something completely different. Right. So, um, a lot of our listeners, they might know the name epigenetics, but why don't you explain to us, you know, in a sure. sim simple terms, what is epigenetics? You know, the simple meaning of epigenetics is beyond genetics. Mm -hmm. Genetics is the DNA that we inherit from our parents, mm -hmm. uh, half from our father and half from our mother. And we inherit it from our ancestors uh, in the human lineage and ancestors before uh, mm -hmm. we became humans. This is what we call genetics. Okay. But to understand what epigenetic is or beyond genetics, we need to understand why this concept developed. And the problem that scientists have encountered uh, in the middle of the previous century was the fact that they already knew that every cell in our body has exactly the same genes, the same DNA, mm -hmm. but every cell in our body is doing different things. Right. For example, some, some of our cells um, make a retina and others make a heart and, and some make a lung mm. and a brain and, and so on and so forth. So scientists started asking the question, how is it possible that exactly the same genes do so many different things? Right. And a scientist in the United Kingdom called Waddington in the late 40s developed this concept epigenetics, which was a combination of uh, different terms in embryology and genetics. But the idea was that something which they had no idea what it is, happens to genes as a baby or an embryo develops from the egg and the sperm into a whole uh, human being or a whole animal. One DNA is going transformation during the process of development. So it becomes a multiple 
uh, numerous uh, possibilities uh, of uh, function. Mm -hmm. And so the field of epigenetics developed from the attempt to explain how one DNA, how one genome can do numerous different things. Mm. So how many genes do we roughly have in the human body? So between 20,000 to 30,000, uh, and they have to do so many different things. If you think about the billions of cells, just think about the brain. Mm -hmm. Almost every neuron in the brain carries different memories, does different tasks. So we have to express probably billions of different programs from only those 20 to 30,000 genes. Yeah. That's an enormous task. Right. And the way it's achieved is by programming these genes in many different ways. Uh, the way I explain it to people is, you know, think about your smartphone. Right. And your smartphone has two components in it. It has an operating system. You know, it could be Android, could right. be Apple, mm -hmm. OS. But the operating system by itself doesn't do very much unless you write apps. Right. And you can take one operating system and, you know, write thousands or maybe tens of thousands or millions of different apps. Mm. So the same phone, the same operating system could do so many different things. And essentially what happens to us when we develop in the womb of our mother is that apps are written on our DNA. Mm. The operating system we inherited from father of mother. That's genetics, the operating system. Right. But the software that programs that operating system, that writes those different programs, is epigenetics. Oh, that is so beautiful. Um, yeah, my mind is blown, right? I know what epigenetics is, but I wasn't, yeah. The way you describe it, oh, that is so beautiful. So now that we know epigenetics, um, why don't you give us some examples of how epigenetics can impact various aspects of our lives? So... When I started investigating epigenetics, as I mentioned before, it was DNA methylation. This is the right. most, uh, what I call proximal, the closest mark on the DNA. Mm -hmm. There are multiple epigenetic marks, and I don't want to confuse our audience, but just they should appreciate there are multiple of those marks, which gives the finesse and the beauty uh, of the exquisite programs that that system can create. Okay. But the basic level is essentially a little chemical mark, actually one of the smallest marks that are added to our DNA as we develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I investigated this mark, how it's added, what are the proteins that add it. Mm -hmm. And I discovered very early in the, in the early 90s that in cancer, for some reason, um, they're doing overtime of adding those marks and removing those marks. Mm. And we found that cancer cells have a completely different way of marking the DNA than normal cells. Interesting. And actually, it makes sense, right? If a liver cells become a liver cancer, it's a different app. It has to do different things. Right. So because it's a different app, it has to write different programs. Mm -hmm. And then you ask yourself the question, okay, what do I do with this information? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can do three things with this information. First, you can ask yourself the question, why does it happen? Why does our DNA start being marked in a very different way? Who is writing those cancer apps in our DNA? Right. The second question is, of course, how do I fix it? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are different ways, pharmacological and today even, you know, epigenetic editing ways to fix those marks. Right. And this is when I start thinking about using DNA methylation modulating drugs as anti-cancer drugs. And the third way that is exciting me a lot today is using those marks as early detection markers. Mm. So as soon as we can mark, uh, find those changes in, in blood, we can detect cancer early. And that's becoming the most exciting area, I think, in, in early detection. That is very and cool. early detection is going to change medicine completely. Right. Non-invasive medical diagnostics, such an important exactly. field. Wow. Very cool. So Moja, I know you've done some really interesting research related to epigenetics and certain experiences in life. Can you tell us some of that that you found? Yes. This is what's really the most exciting, I think, aspect of, of our work is finding that it's not just chemicals that affect us. 
Mm. And something that looks subtle and not as physical as we think things are important uh, has a huge profound impact on us. Okay. And actually, people knew it for a long time that the way a mother takes care of her child or a, or a paternal um, a care has a large impact on the health uh, of the uh, offspring. Mm. Um, you know, economists knew that, sociologists knew that, psychologists knew that, mm -hmm. but heart scientists didn't care because we consider this kind of ephemeral, you know, hard to define. What do you mean maternal care? What does it mean? Right. Uh, you know, we, we believe in chemicals and uh, these are the things we can study, you know, in, in our experiments. Right. But this has bewildered humanity from very early days. You know, is it nature, the physical matter of our lives that defines uh, our trajectories, our life trajectories, how healthy we'll be, how smart we'll be, um, how successful we would be? Or is there an impact of the experience mm. that a human or an animal goes through early in life or even later in life in defining uh, life trajectories? Okay. But since we know that almost everything is encoded in the DNA, mm -hmm. then how on earth uh, could early life experience like maternal love or maternal care uh, affect my blood pressure or my heart rate when I'm 50 or, mm. you know, my, uh, my uh, IQ and so on. Right. So that was kind of a mystery. But epigenetics offered for the first time a perspective that could connect mm -hmm. experience, which is kind of you know, spiritual, ephemeral, as I say, right. in the hardcore of chemistry of the DNA. Mm. And uh, because epigenetics doesn't change the DNA, mm -hmm. it just marks it. And the first study we did with my colleague, Michael Meany, was to look at a model of maternal care in, in rats. And rats, like humans, you know, do maternal care. They're mammals. All right. mammals do maternal care. Right. And they do it in different ways. And there is a natural distribution. You know, some mothers do a lot of it. Some mothers do very little. And mm -hmm. most mothers do something in between. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what happens to the animals as they grow, long after their mother is dead, is that mothers, that, uh, animals that received high-quality maternal care from their mother are less stressed, uh, they are less aggressive, uh, they're less obese, et cetera, et cetera, than wow. animals that went through very harsh uh, childhood, if you want mm. um, to say. And uh, we asked the question, how? This was real, you know, you couldn't right. deny it. Right. But what is the mechanism? How does it work? Mm -hmm. And uh, so many, many years of work uh, established that the care, the maternal environment alters uh, pathways in the brain or the way our chemicals uh, react in the brain. And one of the important chemicals we have in the brain is serotonin. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the kind of chemical that is released when we are happy or where we're successful, etc. Right. And when the mother licks and grooms the pup and takes care of the pup, the pup releases serotonin. Mm. Serotonin interacts with... Uh, receptors in, in, in different brain regions and activates a whole cascade of events that result in epigenetic modification of very critical genes mm. that control stress, that control anxiety, that control depression, etc. Wow. So for the first time, we had a biochemical explanation for the connection between early life experience and what happens to DNA. And what's important is that not that there's an immediate response. We all know that if you're stressed, you have a response. If you're happy, you have a response. Right. But that response is registered in the DNA mm. and stays there and defines how your life will uh, move forward. Epigenetics provided this information because epigenetic is on one hand dynamic. Right. On the other hand, it's extremely stable. So the uh, changes that happen early in life are not changes in the gene. 
But nevertheless, they can stay for a long time and they can define a life trajectory for a long time. Wow. So is it possible for these markers uh, due to these uh, stressful experiences in the past, uh, can they be removed? Of course. Okay. That's the basic difference, right? Uh, our genes are fixed. Yep. Um, you know, now we're talking about gene editing, but these are very sophisticated ways of uh, playing with the genome. Right. But the genome that you inherit, you're going to pass to your children and to your grandchildren and so on. And uh, the methylation and other epigenetics marks are reversible. Mm -hmm. They are introduced by writers and removed by erasers. Mm. And so these erasers and writers that add or remove those, the guys who write the software, you know, the programmers, right. uh, they can be changed. Mm. So if you use certain drugs or certain behaviors or certain nutritional supplements, you can change the way these erasers uh, or writers work and modulate. And this is what we tested. We asked the question, exactly your question is, let's take a rat that had a low maternal care, uh -huh. ha had adverse um, you know, experiences when, when that pup was um, an infant. Mm -hmm. And now the pup is an adult and it behaves in a certain way that reflects the adverse experience when the pup was a baby. Mm -hmm. But can we now add a epigenetic drug and change it. Mm. And amazingly, we could. So we could actually reverse not only the epigenetic marks, but also the behavior that was registered by these epigenetic marks. Wow. But if we go back to your app and software, you know, if you know how to write the script, you can change the script at any point. And this is exactly uh, what we did. Interesting. Wow. Fascinating. It's cool, you know, that the situation, bleak as it might be in the in the past, can be modulated via science in right. the present. Right. That's the optimistic message. Right. So I always say that genetics is pessimistic. Uh, epigenetics is optimistic. Oh, I love that. Uh, because genetics is predetermined, right? You, right? It's very hard to change the genes you inherited. Mm -hmm. But how uh, you take care of your inheritance and that's epigenetics and that's up to you and up to you know society and your parents and etc. Right. Oh, wonderful. How cool is that? Um I know you've also done some great research and, and you might have already touched on it a little bit but related to epigenetics and behavior. Right. Is, is there anything else you would tell us about that? So epigenetics is involved heavily in behavior. Mm. And one sign that epigenetics is extremely important for behavior is the fact that when the genes that encode the epigenetic, what we call machinery, you know, the erasers, the readers, the, uh, the writers of the marks, right. if they are defective, uh, most of the symptoms that people see are mental, mental health symptoms, right. suggesting that the brain is really critically dependent on a functional uh, epigenetic system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's highly susceptible to, to alterations uh, that can affect the epigenetic system. Mm. So for example, addiction is most probably written in our DNA through epigenetic mechanisms. Wow. And we have shown that it could be removed, at least in animals, by epigenetic interventions. Mm -hmm. And so addiction is a classic example of an experience. And this, in this case, it's the experience of experiencing a drug right. and the long-term consequences that it has. So for example, if you take an animal that was trained to self-administer cocaine, right. that animal if it's removed, let's say, to a rehab facility, you know, put in a cage without being exposed to cocaine, mm -hmm. it's okay. But if you, after a month or two months, you show that animal anything that reminds the animal uh, of the cocaine experience, the animal will start craving cocaine. Mm -hmm. And if you provide it with um, a, a way to self-administer cocaine, it will just do it in a very addic addictive way. Right. Similar to humans. Right. 
And we found out that this whole process involves changing in the way genes uh, are programmed in the brain uh, and that uh, it's, it's defined by epigenetic machineries. The other interesting thing in addiction is why some people become addicted and others not. Right. You know, are there early experiences that, um, that program our DNA in the brain uh, to be more susceptible to addiction? Mm. Wow. So what you're saying is that, you know, uh, traumatic experiences earlier in life can lead to some of these health issues that, that we have, uh, that people can have later on. Exactly. Wow. That is really fascinating. Are there any other examples you, you would give us on how epigenetics can impact aspects of our lives based on the research that you've done? Uh, you know, of course, the best example is, is uh, nutrition. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that the early nutritional restriction will reprogram our brain and our body towards obesity and binging. Yes. And if you think about it, it makes absolute sense, right? Uh, when a baby is born, a baby gets cues, what kind of life it's going to live. And based on these cues, uh, the body is writing the proper codes to cope with, to fit into that anticipated situation, right? Right. And so if you anticipate hunger, because you were nutritionally restricted in the womb because something happened to your mother or was it stress or she didn't feed well or she fed too well, right. all these things send signals to the baby to program the DNA in the brain, in fat tissue, in muscle tissue to adjust to those anticipated environments. Mm. So if the anticipated environment is famine, you better binge, right? Because right. you never know when your second meal will come. Okay. Not only that, turn everything into fat, which is the most stable way uh, of um, saving energy. Right. However, if what happens is that uh, this was a false signal because you live in the United States and whether you're poor or rich, you know, you can get many, many calories for one or two dollars. Right. And so what happened in Western society is there's a disconnect between this very useful programming early in life, are you going to be poor or rich? Right. And which meant throughout evolution, it meant that uh, you won't have enough food or you have a lot of food, so be ready for these two possibilities. And now it doesn't mean the same thing anymore because mm. poor people can have access to high calorie diets. And therefore you see that uh, we de start developing obesity because we have those signals from early life that are now in a very maladaptive kind of environment, these signals become maladaptive. They're not useful anymore. Wow. So epigenetics helps to explain uh, the observation that obese parents, um, that, that uh, children of obese parents have a higher risk of being obese. Yes. Uh, children of obese parents have a higher risk of be being obese or children who were starved uh, early in life uh, have a high risk of being obese and um, and so on and so this is a big field today in in uh, in in science is understanding how early life nutrition affects later life uh, you know um, uh, metabolic uh, health wow and um you know sugar tolerance diabetes f obesity etc Wow. And, and that's an important area where early intervention could make a huge difference. Right. One thing I'm fascinated about when you mentioned nutrition, it seems like some of these uh, small molecules, organic molecules in plants, may be one of the reasons that they're beneficial is they help to modulate gene expression or signal transduction right. pathways related to epigenetics. Right. Many, many, many um, small molecules uh, can affect the epigenetic system. Some because they are a part of the natural uh, pathway that regulates the epigenetic system. For example, S-adenosylmethionine, which is right. a donor of the methyl group. Uh, others because they signal uh, on the pathway, right? This is a very complex web and, and the right. signaling can happen anywhere on, on this web. Uh, and, 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 and the trick is to figure out you know, what combination of nutritional supplements uh, uh, is 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 sending good signals that we want to have, 
right? Right. And and those signals could be different in different contexts, right? Right. I mean, they might be different for somebody who lives in a wealthy, um, fat society versus somebody who lives in a famine, you know, um, society. And um, yeah. and so there's no one solution for all. That's what makes this whole area interesting it has to be personalized we, we understand that and it had to, has to be contextualized right um, wow interesting so yeah so if we were to help to regulate or support epigenetics in people it's not a, a blanket approach you kind of no. like a personalized epigenetics right interesting <laughs> And it's more a self-learning and self-reinforcement approach, right? right. I mean, uh, we need to learn through ex um, experimenting with ourselves is mm -hmm. what is working for us, right? And right. It's, a, it's a lifelong kind of commitment. Right. Um, wow. So we've talked about lifestyle factors that can uh, alter epigenetics. Uh, what about pollution? Is there any research how pollution in, um, in the air? There's can... quite a lot of research now on environmental um, pollutants and okay. the impact they have on uh, uh, on different on the epigenetic system, and of course the impact they have on on our, our health. Right. Um, you know, the classic example, of course, is smoking and cancer, or. Mm -hmm or different uh, pollutants that are found and can uh, cause lung cancer, um, which is probably driven by epigenetic modulations. Right. Um, but uh, almost every um, hazardous material will have uh, epigenetic consequences. Some will be short-term, others can be long-term, other can, others can be transgenerational. Right. Wow. That is amazing. Let's now move on to, I know you are world leader, you're the father of uh, the field of epigenetics and medical diagnostic applications for the detection of diseases and other health conditions. Uh, can you explain to our listeners some of the research that you've done in that area and some of the applications that you're doing? So, well, you know, if we go back to the uh, metaphor we used in early on, which is, you know, we have different apps that, that, that run our programs, right? Right. And um, and each app has a script, right? It's a, a coder has to write the script. And um, if you know the difference between a disease app and a healthy app, uh, you can fix, you can identify who is diseased and who is healthy, right? Right. So if, for example, uh, we have a tumor grow starting to grow in our body, that tumor's DNA is going to have different epigenetic marks than the normal cells from the same tissue and normal cells from any other tissue. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is that DNA is shed into the blood. And if we can fish it from the blood, like pulling the needle from the haystack, yeah. but because we know the difference between the needle and the haystack, we can immediately identify the needle. Mm. And even if there's there are very few molecules of this kind, uh, we can start seeing them in the blood early on okay. and then use it uh, to detect, for example, cancer early. Some of these markers can be markers of other damage that happen to the body, like uh, diabetes, when there's damage to the pancreas, okay. or uh, heart conditions, when there's damage to the heart. DNA from these tissues will start f floating in the blood, could be detected, and using... Uh, sequencing technologies that allow us to read exactly the script, we can say, wow, this is not a script of a normal DNA. This is a script of a cancer DNA. Wow. So what we're doing is we're developing the, um, the tests that are based on this. Uh, wow. And our goal, our hope is that tests of this sort uh, will be a routine checkup. You know, mm -hmm. like today we're checking our sugar and uh, blood pressure and, and lipids. And we'll be able to check those things. And, and really, cancer becomes a very simple disease when it's detected early. It's a horrible situation when it's detected late. Right. So if people could, uh, you know, routinely follow up the emergence of cancer cells um, and, and take care of it early on, uh, it will have a huge impact on uh, morbidity and, and mortality. Wow. Th that's amazing. You know, I'm thinking about some of the tests that are offered today, the DNA tests, 
Yeah. You know, and what a lot of people don't know is those DNA tests, you know, they, they tell maybe something about propensity for, but they tell exactly. you, they tell you nothing about what's happening in real time. And so that's why, right. yeah, this is amazing. So you're able to see in real time how things yeah. are changing, how things are progressing, uh, you know, degressing, degrading, and those sorts of things. Exactly. Because what will happen is as the tumor grows, it will shed more and more of this kind of DNA. So, so you can follow or you can follow if your therapy actually worked because that DNA will disappear from the blood. And, and so I think that that will change dramatically how uh, we look at diseases like cancer and other bad diseases. Right. I believe, uh, you know, maintaining your heart. Um, um, health and um, and uh, your uh, cardiovascular health will also use similar tests. But right. we hope one day also psychiatry and um, yes. and stress and anxiety and PTSD will be will be tested by these kind of tests. So early detection will allow early intervention before things uh, deteriorate. Right. Yeah. The field of uh, psychiatry. I mean, you know, a lot right. of these things like schizophrenia and bipolar. So, exactly. so in theory, with a test like this, you could see if, you know, someone who has bipolar, for instance, and is undergoing CBT, or they have OCD and they're undergoing CBT to try to, you know, fight back the tide, using this type of test, you could potentially see if those therapies are working. Is that correct? Right. The only challenge with the brain is, is that the DNA that is found in the blood is different than the DNA that is found in the brain. Uh -huh. And and what slows down this field of research is, is understanding how much of the things that are happening in the blood are informative on what is happening in the brain. Right. Because we don't have access to the brain, right? Yeah. We cannot get DNA from the brain. Right. Uh, although it is becoming clear that even from the, you know, when there's some damage to the brain, there is DNA from the brain in the blood, which okay. can actually use to detect early early damage to the brain. Oh, so that's promising. So Moja, what you're saying is with this test, where you can detect epigenetics and, and changes in real time, it seems to me that perhaps with uh, you know psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, OCD, and those sorts of things, you might be able to see if cognitive behavioral therapies and other therapies could be improving the condition. You're right. And actually, this is a very active field of research. Uh, psychiatrists, uh, epigeneticists are trying to find out whether we can find markers in DNA that are indicators of, um, of uh, those conditions mm -hmm. and could be followed up to find out whether, you know, we are changing something. Wow. And the only problem with psychiatry and epigenetics is that the DNA that is important for psychiatry, or most of it, is in the brain. Oh. And the brain is very hard to access in, with non-invasive methods. Mm -hmm. And so the big question in the field, which is still controversial, is how much does the blood DNA represent what's going on in the brain? Okay. Definitely, there are results that suggest that there are markers of what's happening in the brain in the blood, and but it's still not as strong as what we see in cancer. Mm. Uh, it, but another source of DNA that is relevant to the brain is if there is brain damage, they would be DNA from the brain in the blood and might be useful for, you know, early neurological diseases like uh, the detection of diseases uh, from stroke to, um, to Alzheimer's and, and, diseases of this sort. So wow. this is a very early time in the field and technologies are still developing. But potentially, uh, there's a, a huge uh, opportunity there. Wow, that's really fascinating. So it seems like the, the sky's basically the limit when it comes to epigenetics and its ability or potential to give us Absolutely. information about various uh, right. health conditions in the body. Because epigenetics is the dynamic picture of our body. Epigenetics is a movie. Right. You know, genetics is like a, a, a book, but epigenetics is a constantly interactive movie, right? Right. We're holding the remote control and we're changing how that movie goes. And by mapping the this epigenome, 
uh, mapping this movie, uh, you get a good understanding of where you are in life and, and where you're heading wow. and what are the kind of changes you need to make. Wow. What a beautiful analogy. So now that we've talked about all the incredible things that epigenetics can do and the information it uh, gives on the body, I think all of our listeners are wondering, and I think we might be freaked out, right, about epigenetics and what's going on, but what are actionable things we can do to improve our epigenetics, maybe to remove some of these markers that are detrimental to our health? Right. So the actions... Some of them we know from, you know, human social evolution, right? You know, certain behaviors that we developed uh, are actually uh, good for us. Uh (laughs) For example, uh, maternal care. Okay. And maternal breastfeeding and and good dietary habits and uh, exercise. Uh, You know, there's evidence that all these things uh, are affecting the epigenome in a way that increases our well-being. Um, but what epigenetics allows us is to test those things um, and keep learning what is working better. Right. And so the future that I see will be, you know, we start with all these things that we know already uh, from human history, from human uh, social evolution, that they are good for us. Right. And we keep learning how to improve and modify them using tools that allow us to get a a quick measure of how our genome uh, is changing. And so, uh, for example, we definitely need source of metal uh, groups to sustain the epigenetic machinery. Deprivation of metal groups uh, by by certain diets that are poor in in, in those monocarbons that, that, you know, will contribute, like the uh, poor in folic acid or vitamin B12. Right. And um, they will cause trouble. So there, these are certain things we know, but there are a lot of things to learn. Right. And I think we we'll learn by, by experimenting, by experience, wow. by trial and error. So it sounds like this field is just in its infancy. Yes, it is in infancy as far as a scientific understanding of what's going on. But I think it's as old as human evolution, in fact, of the behaviors that we have adopted that that are good for us. And um, we have to be respectful of human evolution. If we have certain behaviors, there's probably a good reason for it, why they were selected. Right. So one thing that epigenetics gives you is Respect for your elders and respect for the history of humanity, uh, because the best school is human history Mm. and figuring out, you know, what people have figured out by trial and error uh, works for them. And of course, what doesn't work. Right. But what science will do, it will provide an explanation that will speed up this learning process and focus it. on getting a, you know, better results. Wow. Fascinating. So Moja, it's been incredible talking to you today. What final comments would you leave our, uh, our listeners about epigenetics? Epigenetics is teaching us how much in our life is under our control, how much we have to learn. And that by active dynamic learning and relearning, uh, we have the opportunity and a potential uh, to improve our lives. And we should start moving from just protecting ourselves from disease uh, to increasing uh, the quality of our well-being, uh, which is in the DNA potential. Our DNA has enormous potential because one genome can have billions of epigenetic programs. Right. And this potential we can harness uh, by proper uh, usage of learning from history, from experiencing, and from science. Wow. Amazing. Moja, every time I talk to you, my mind is just blown. 
about your wealth of knowledge and the things that you share. So it's been amazing talking with you. You're, you're an Thank amazing you. scientist, a great friend, and you're an incredible human being. Thank you so much for being Thank on the show. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening, my friends. This is Dr. Dan signing off.